thank everyone for coming and joining uh, ThinkWise in Monica Rivera this morning. Uh, this morning, we're going to be presenting the role of competencies in the workplace. Um, as I mentioned uh, a second ago, uh, my name is Steve Griffin with ThinkWise. Um, we are uh, a, a human resource talent development company, largely uh, centered around competency management from hiring to 360s. And we've invited an, an expert panelist to come and share a discussion with you, Monica Vergara. Monica, I'd like to turn this over uh, to you so you can get us started this morning. Thank you, Steve. Um, and thank you, everybody who has set aside time this morning to, uh, to join our conversation. Um, so, Steve, just to double check, is my screen showing right now? Yep, you're good, and you can start transitioning when you're ready, Monica. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. So, um, let's see, we've talked about, just to give you a little bit of background about uh, business impact and my background. Um, so, um, I have a background in industrial and organizational psychology. Uh, went to George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. Um, started my consulting practice back in 2005 after working for a number of years at Anheuser-Busch, the Budweiser Brewing Company, and in consulting um, with uh, at an outplacement firm in Virginia. Um, but when I started my practice, I focused on charter schools, which were organizations that were growing and developing or really budding, a budding com concept in education at the time. And so most of my work has focused on using competencies to understand what makes a teacher effective to understand how do we evaluate teacher performance or to help school leaders understand how to develop their teachers into leaders and create a teacher, a leader pipeline and how to develop themselves. Um, so in addition to collaborating with education um, organizations, I have also worked with um, large organizations such as Siemens, um, Amway, Spectrum Health, um, and Society of Petroleum Engineers. So I'm wanting to bring all of this expertise and experience to help us today focus on competencies and the role that they play in the workplace. So I wanna start by looking at this quote from Warren Buffett. The most important thing in terms of your circle of competence is not how large the area of it is, but how well you've defined the perimeter. So the key phrase here is how well you've defined the perimeter. And competencies can help us do just that. So for instance, in selection, competencies define the perimeter by helping us clarify what we are looking for in a candidate or in an ideal employee. Um, in performance evaluation, they define the perimeter by helping us understand what great looks like, what makes a teacher highly effective. Not just, I just don't want a teacher, I want a teacher who is going to be highly effective. And what does that look like? And in development, um, competencies help us define or clarify how to support um, a struggling employee or how to help them stretch and grow or how to help them work around certain challenges. So speaking of clarity, I think it's important for us to understand or start with defining what is a competency. So here I want to give you an initial definition of a competency. So let's take a look at this. A competency is a cluster of behaviors representing one facet of what is needed to perform a job. So 
hopefully this definition um, is beginning to help you understand competencies and see them in a specific light, representing one facet of what is needed to perform a job. So if we take, if we take part of that definition, what is needed to perform a job? We can right away see that um, competencies can provide us with a common language because if we are all on the same page on what is needed, then um, there's less confusion and we can more easily move toward that goal. So we will be talking more about how um, competencies as a common language play a role in the workplace and how this has been critical with some of the clients that I work with over time. So I have a couple of case studies that I will share with you toward the end of our presentation that will really highlight the role of competencies as a common language. But I want to not just give you that initial definition, I want to supplement that definition or give you um, what I consider the best practice definition. And that is, competency is a specific set of behaviors or performance indicators associated with a facet of exceptional performance in an organizational role. So there's a couple of pieces that we've added to our initial definition here. And those are performance indicators meaning the things that will tell us what great looks like, and behaviors that are associated with a facet of exceptional performance um, in a job. So it's not just um, what is needed to perform a job, but what is needed to perform exceptionally. So, um, and the, the third part that I didn't highlight here is that we need to put it all into context. So there is the part about exceptional performance in an organizational role. So it's not just what does great look like, but what does great look like in my environment, in my organization, maybe even at this time, right? So be thinking about that definition. Perhaps you can think about competency in particular and apply it to your own environment. Um, say, for instance, how does the competency of managing conflict in the workplace, um, handling difficult conversations, um, what would that competency look like in your environment? What would be the indicators that would tell you that a manager is handling difficult conversations in the best of ways and what would make sense in your particular context? How would you want them to do that, given the culture of your organization? Um, so now, in keeping with our definition and kind of broadening our understanding of a competency, I want to talk about some of the ingredients that make up a competency. So. Um, Competency is really a set of knowledge, skills, abilities, and other factors in action. KSAs, most of us have heard knowledge, skills, abilities, other factors such as our values, which can change over time, our traits or personality, which tend to stay pretty constant and consistent over time in our motivation. When we take all of these ingredients, KSAs and other factors, KSA O's, and combine them or when they interact within a certain individual, then what we see, what gets expressed or what we see um, is skillful behavior. Um, so a competency is also 
can also be understood as skillful behavior, which is the result of KSAOs in action. Another way of looking at a competency um, is to view it like an iceberg where there's visible and hidden parts. So here we have a beautiful graphic of an iceberg and you can see the top part, which is the visible part. Um, and let's use uh, a competency as an example. So the competency of listening, um, active listening. So the visible part of the competency would be um, the behaviors that we would observe. So um, actual eye contact, uh, the person nodding, um, smiling, or paraphrasing what we are saying. That's the visible part. The hidden part would be what we call listening intent or potential, which is the know-how that the person has regarding listening and what his or her personal thoughts and feelings about listening may be. Um, so as you can see, a couple of things to notice here. One is that um, the visible part represents only about a third of what is really the entire um, competency, right? So we can only see about a third of what is really what is really there. And so when I um, when I do training with school leaders and managers in organizations around behavioral interviewing. I use this same um, image or graphic to help them understand what is their role in interviewing, is to uncover that those two thirds of the iceberg that we really cannot see, or to get more of an insight and an understanding about what is the hidden part. Um, and behavioral interviewing is really the best uh, approach um, for being able to understand that. Um, so actually, let me go back for a second. So um, to tie this back to our understanding of competencies as a skillful behavior, um, what we are seeing, the visible part, is really the expression of what lies below. So um, if you look at this information, the information here on this chart, um, I want you to note that there is a description of what listening behavior is, but this description is not complete yet. Um, it needs to be further qualified to fit the environment or the organization um, so that we can actually consider it uh, a competency as such, okay? And so uh, later on, I will be showing you um, an actual competency description of listening behavior. So just hold that in mind. Um, one more thing I want to say about that. Um, just to put it in context as well. So think about listening behavior and how it could vary. You know, listening behavior could be different for um, an elementary school teacher where the teacher is really checking for understanding as they are listening to their students participate. But it would be very different for, say, a healthcare provider um, where they are listening to the patient. Uh, patient's description to get an accurate diagnostic or how their their listening attitude and behavior may mean the difference between the patient feeling like they are satisfied with how the uh, healthcare provider uh, was present with them and listened to them or not. Um, so again, putting 
the competency in context is really important. Okay, so um, um, so in the next section, I would like to talk about how um, how we can use competency and how competencies inform talent management. And just to emphasize the point, really it's all about clarity. I want to reiterate um, that competencies, their main role when you boil it down is to help us have clarity. Because Let's talk a little bit about what happens when we don't have clarity, right? So, um, interestingly, competency models uh, are now recognized as a best practice in organizations as a way to provide a blueprint for how to perform a series of vital functions to the organization, specifically within talent management. Um, but many times we see that different criteria are used to hire, to promote, to evaluate, and to train people, sometimes even within the same organization. Um, so what happens when there is lack of clarity? So um, I've had the experience of going into an organization um, and realizing that different sets of criteria were being used for hiring managers, for um, for evaluating them for performance appraisals and even a different set of criteria being used for how to develop them and for their 360 um, survey for development. So um, imagine what that must result in, right? So the impact of having all these different or competing sometimes contradictory sets of um, behavioral standards is that it causes confusion and rather than creating effectiveness and um, resulting in your intended goal of higher having optimal performance it can actually be detrimental to your entire talent management efforts so so really the remedy to that is to choose and stick with a standard of terms um, so that all your systems can revolve around that standard set and you can have um, the best the best results. Um, again, a common language that would allow all your talent man management systems to talk to each other and reinforce the organizational talent strategy. So, so okay, so I just want to make the po point here again that um, competency models provide a common language. They help us all row in the same direction or be on the same page. And I'm particularly curious to ask you at this point in the conversation or the presentation, why do comp competencies matter to you? Um, I'm really curious, why did you choose to be here today? Uh, it may be because you're wanting to align your company's strategy. Um, you want to hire better candidates. You want to maintain a competitive advantage. You want to improve performance. Uh, please go ahead and answer. I'm very curious to know. Thanks, Monica. So we're going to host the, the poll question online and allow everyone to um, provide some response to that. We'll give everyone uh, a few moments um, to give their response, and we'll provide those uh, answers here in a minute. And I just want to take this uh, time again to, to say thank you to, to Monica for coming in with your area of expertise around competency uh, and competency management as it relates to talent inside organizations. And after this poll, we'll be transitioning into Monica's experience on how to provide that clarity inside an organization here in just a moment. Thank you, Steve. 
We're going to hold the poll probably just for a few more seconds and then we'll turn it over here in just a moment. Okay. Okay, Monica, we have um, the breakdown of responses here with the company alignment with strategy as being the leader and some mid-tier responses around hiring better candidates and then performance and the, the least responded to uh, reason for uh, competencies mattering to a company is maintaining a competitive advantage. So I'd like to turn, turn it over to you, Monica, to maybe respond to some of the uh, insights that we have here from, from our guests. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. So this is, I find this particularly telling, right? Because um, obviously I would say I'm a bit biased toward using competencies for hiring better candidates or for improving performance. Um, but um, the truth or the reality is that we have to start with aligning our strategy, our company strategy. And competencies are really truly a reflection or they, they should emanate or, or come from or be informed by the company's, the company's goals, the mission and the vision. So really, um, it's no surprise that we are seeing these results. And perhaps what this tells me is that this may be where the majority of our audience find themselves or things that they are noticing, um, that they need to have that kind of alignment. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. This is fascinating, fascinating result and very telling. So, um, So then let's 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 actually talk about using competencies. Um, focus on this a bit more. So how do we use competencies? Um, I want to go back to um, remember I, I mentioned earlier I was going to come back to this active listening competency and show you an example of a fully fledged or fully developed uh, competency description, right? So active listening, if you see on this slide, there's different ways or, or different pieces that um, the competency definition can, can provide us with. So first of all, you see that statement or that paragraph at the top that really tells us what effect what active listening looks like what great looks like um effective performers offer their full attention when others speak they listen actively giving verbal and nonverbal cues of their interest when the speaker has finished they paraphrase what was said to ensure understanding and so then we have that paragraph broken down into pieces or elements to say what effective performers do when they're actively listening. And then we can ask questions to say, okay, to what extent does this individual um, display this performance? I'm sorry, this, this competency effectively. Are they paraphrasing to ensure understanding? Do they give their full attention without interrupting? So you can see how Having these elements of the competency can already help you in um, coming up with specific questions to ask in an interview um, or coming up with indicators of performance when you're doing a performance evaluation or thinking about, well, how else does this person, can this person develop this particular competency? So. You can also look, see it as helping you understand what, what, it, um, 
when you have too little of this competency, what does that look like? Or how can individuals with too little of this competency be perceived? Um, and what happens when you have too much of this competency? So remember, for each competency, um, it can be sort of like a double-edged sword. You can have too much or too little of it. So looking for the right amount um, can be part of the part of the goal, right? Um, and then we have some tips for development, um, and we have some questions. And you can even have a quote. So this is, um, admittedly, this is a, a very thorough um, competency definition. In most cases, you will see a definition that will include just the top part, the top paragraph, and maybe if it's an interview guide, it will have that top definition definition broken down into elements so that the interviewer can know what to look for as they are asking the interview questions. Okay. So, um, so here's one way of using competencies. Um, at this point, you may be, I'm curious and I'm wondering, and I, I guess I'll get to find out a bit more later but i'm wondering how you may be feeling or where you may be in terms of your um decision to use competencies or where you may be at um in deciding whether to create a competency model or how to use the competency model um what i want to say is um have the courage to press on <laughs> to your destination in keeping with our navigation theme um that competencies will provide you with that um, with that guidance and that clarity to to move on to press on um, so this slide um, is going to highlight precisely what we found as part of the the results of our poll um, which is that Really, competency modeling starts with looking at the mission and vision of your organization. And that is really and truly where you need to start. And it's, it needs to start with the leaders of the organization deciding that this is what they're going to do and having a very um, thorough discussion about um, what is it, how, how they want to see that mission and vision come to life, what the mission and vision will result in in terms of business goals and how we're going to achieve those business goals in our particular organization. Um, once you have that, then you can see that competencies will become a central piece to the, ta the whole talent management function so from talent planning to talent assessment to talent acquisition talent integration performance and development so um, competencies come from the mission and vision and then they become central to all of the talent functions talent management functions um, i particularly like this this chart because it really I feel drives the point of how central competencies are to talent management and to the success of an organization like Warren Buffett said if you don't have a well-defined perimeter um, then uh, you, you won't be successful so I want to take a couple of these Talent management functions. Um, and just kind of highlight how competencies are used in each of them. So if we look at talent acquisition, um, competencies can uh, provide a clear framework for the interviewing process. 
um, they can give us the ideal criteria for comparing candidates to the job requirements. They can actually save us from the pitfall of comparing candidates to each other when we're making hiring decisions um, by actually giving us the standards, right? So we need the competencies to provide the standard to tell us this is what we are looking for. And so you compare candidate A to the competency model, candidate B to the competency model, um, instead of comparing candidate A to candidate B. Um, so then um, if we look at uh, performance, uh, competencies can give us uh, or clarify the job descriptions and the individual role that um, requirements for that um, for that description um, and they can help us set performance expectations so I'm often surprised by how many organizations I work with um, that want me to help them with their hiring process and with having clarity about who to hire and who's the best candidate and they don't have a job description <laughs> um, and so they are not even clear themselves about what the role is and what it entails and what is required and many times these these um, elements of the hiring process uh, are minimized and we tend to assume that we know what we're looking for but then when I sit down with a team of hiring managers and start talking about, okay, well, what is needed for this job? What are, what are the roles that this person will play? Many times they are surprised to find out that they have different perspectives or views about what their role should be about. So um, really job descriptions are um, critical and they should really be tied to the competency model. Um, so if you have, um, if you have clear job descriptions that are linked to the competency model, then you're more likely to be able to um, be fair in your assessment of performance and, um, and be intentional in using that information to, to drive performance and to increase performance. So then we move on to development and that same information can play or become part of the learning objectives of a development pro program and um, competency models can become part of the criteria or the indicators for a 360 degree survey so really you can see we are using the same information in different ways um, across these these functions to provide consistency, to provide clarity, um, and to optimize, to optimize effectiveness. Okay, so here's our, our second poll question. Um, and this is where I get to find out, where are you on this journey? Are you feeling fragmented and don't know where to start? Um, are you in the process of implementation of your competency model or using competencies in a specific function within your organization? Um, are you in full alignment to the strategy and performance expectations? I'm curious to hear. Please go ahead and share. So everyone will have uh, just a, maybe a quick minute to respond to the, to the poll question. Um, it should be up on your screen. Again, thanks to, to Monica for sharing with us um, as we started in the morning, kind of a, a, an overview of the, the importance of competencies as, as it relates to a full talent management strategy. And we moved into clarifying um, the, the importance of that. Soon after, uh, Monica is going to transition into some contextual uh, work that she's done around competencies with two different types of companies to help bring that uh, to light for everyone and um, kind of color in a little bit more on, on the importance of competencies. So we're going to hold this uh, poll just maybe another five or ten seconds and then Monica will turn it back over to you um, to respond to any, any insights you see from the responses.
Wonderful. <laughs> so, um, Steve, do you want to do you want to review the percentages, or do you want me to just? Yeah, no, thanks, Monica. <laughs> so, um, it seems like we have a leader with the process of implementation is where people are at right now, and and that has yep. many different avenues to travel down too. It's not necessarily a clear path, despite a process, but it's definitely the leader here with. The, the second or the first and the third options coming in mm -hmm. um, uh, tied. So there's quite a bit still out there that are kind of fragmented and don't know where to start. And Monica, I may stop there and ask if do you have any insights on how people can actually get started? Because um, that's probably a very difficult uh, time for some of the um, people that are on our discussion this morning. Absolutely. Um. Yes, so so the place to start is to, and I don't say this lightly, is to make sure that your leadership has bought into the idea of having a competency model and, and understands the importance of having a competency model or competencies that will inform talent management. Um, so having that, um, sort of buy-in or, or support from leadership is important. The next step is to take a look at um, the mission and vision. <laughs> like really, if you, if you take the chart that we were looking at earlier, um, looking at the goals of the organization and looking at the different um, functions of the organization and how, um, how each of those functions is going to contribute to um, to the business goals and to the mission. And from there, you start to look at different roles in the organization. Um, and maybe you will need to you will need you will need to survey and get um, everybody on the same page and on a really um, open and honest conversation about, well, what is going to be required for us to be effective or to have the results that we want in each of these categories. So when we look at um, the different functions of an organization, I'm trying to think, give, give one as an example, um, but it may be healthcare, for instance, you know, looking at, um, the medical providers would be one aspect, looking at how um, the financial and the operations side of the organization supports the medical function. Um, so looking at all of these pieces and seeing, okay, what is going to be critical? Uh, when we look at even um, looking at who are our highest performers in each of these in each of these functions, can we interview them? Can we somehow distill what they are doing um, that makes them be great at their role? And, and then taking all that information and um, summarizing it or giving it a label that you all agree on. Um, so there are, um, there are organizations who can help you with this process, such as ThinkWise. Uh, ThinkWise can help you in facilitating the process of 
having a set of competencies that can already provide you with that clarity or like common language. So that definitely reduces a lot of the um, back and forth and maybe stress and anxiety of coming up with the right language. Um, and, and gives you also a, a standardized process to follow um, to be able to, to arrive at which are the competencies that really stand out. You may start out with something like 20 competencies to begin with and then narrow it down to something like seven to 12 at the most, probably. Um, so is that, do you have anything to add here, Steve? No, that was very thorough and I appreciate it. And I'm sure our, our guests this morning appreciate how thorough that was, um, especially starting off with making sure you have your leadership and stakeholders wanting uh, to help inform that process and not doing that alone. Yeah, um, thanks. absolutely. I appreciate that. Yes, absolutely. But yeah, so, so most of you find yourself in the process of implementation and um, yeah, that can feel like you're a little bit in limbo, sort of getting started, not quite sure how it's going to turn out. Um, so hopefully the information that you are getting today is at least going to reassure you that uh, that, that sort of uneasiness <laughs> of where you find yourself in right now is, is worth, it's, it's worth the, um, your time and effort, you know, it's, it's worth going through. Um, yep. So and Monica, as we transition, I, I especially think that case studies that you designed to share this morning will help everyone understand uh, a little bit more in depth of what it takes to get out of that fragmented <laughs> area and at least move into the, the implementation phase. Sure. Thank you. So let me go ahead and move on to that. Um, I have two case studies to share with you, um, competencies and context. I'm going to start with uh, teacher selection. So um, this is, I mean, I'm saying it's a case study, but it's really the process that I have followed, where it's kind of like an amalgamation of my experience working with many charter schools um, over the years on helping them answer these questions. So um, just to give you a bit of history here, charter schools, when they started out, or when they start out, tend to be grassroots organizations uh, composed of teachers with the best of intentions, parents who want to see things um, change um, and be better for their kids and they just sit on this journey and they don't have an HR department and they don't have an accounting department and so um, usually the point at which they reach out to me is when they have gotten started um, they have hired a few wonderful teachers that are amazing and then a bunch of other teachers who are really not working and who have, again, the best of intentions, but don't seem to be um, delivering the high quality teaching in the classroom that they want. So um, then they turn to me and they say, well, you know, we want to hire more of these wonderful teachers, <laughs> but how do we do that? How do we clone them? Um, and so what makes a teacher effective? And so, um, what has been fascinating is that, again, in highlighting what competencies can do for an organization is not just to answer the question of what makes a teacher effective, but what makes a teacher effective at my school, because I could potentially say, okay, I've done this process with this one charter school. Um, I already know what a teacher, a highly effective teacher looks like. But that's not true. It's going to change from school to school. It's going to be different if it's a middle school teacher or a high school teacher or an elementary teacher. Um, and um, so 
So, so yeah, so the competencies and the process help us answer these questions. What makes a teacher effective at my school, in my environment? How do we hire more highly effective teachers? How do we communicate what we are looking for in highly effective teachers across our now growing organization and to all of our 10 school leaders, right? So as we grow, how do we maintain that quality? How do we all stay on the same page? So this is, this is how competencies can help, right? So um, a little bit about the process that I followed to help them answer these questions. Um, I administered a valid and reliable personality assessment to the teaching staff. And then I used the data on their personality traits to uh, find statistically significant differences between the high performers and the low performers. So say it's a staff of 50 teachers. I asked the school leaders, the founders or the school leaders to tell me of these 50 teachers, who are your highest performers that you want to clone and you want to have more of? who are your struggling teachers or mediocre teachers and who are your low performers and having that information then i was able to look or find patterns and to be able to uncover the critical traits um, that clearly distinguished or separated the high performers um, and so now if you recall the ingredients of a competency um, personality traits are part of the competency, but they're not the full competency. So, um, however, that understanding of the critical traits was really powerful because in a way, um, as I went from school to school, the critical traits would almost always um, mirror the culture of the organization. And so we could use that information on the critical traits of the highly effective teachers to then have conversations about, okay, well, um, for instance, we're finding out that highly effective teachers are um, highly resilient. They bounce back from stress very easily and they can for instance, have a really bad lesson one morning and um, then leave that classroom, go into the next classroom, and in between, you know, as they are walking from one classroom to the next, kind of figure out what's going to be their strategy so that they can correct their lesson and make it better for the next group. Um, so they're very resilient, resourceful, bounce back from stress quickly and they can come back the next day and do it all over again and just keep going. So we know that that is a, a personality trait, uh, but how is that going to be expressed in our environment? How do we take that information and then say, okay, in our school, teachers, highly effective teachers are, how do we describe them? What would you say? And so then, it's very engaging. You know, the, the leaders are um, sort of having all these insights about what makes their teachers effective. And they're starting to then use the culture and their perspectives about what kind of environment they want to create in the school to complete that definition, just like we did with active listening, right? Um, so then that definition is then used to. Um, develop interview questions and to create a set of indicators or things to look for. Um, just bullet points that would tell the interviewer, um, we're looking for highly resilient teachers. Uh, our best teachers demonstrate this behavior. So it looks like this. Um, so, yeah, I think the bottom line here is that um, the exercise of uncovering effectiveness or um, behaviors that are particularly 
separating performers um, is critical to then arriving at competencies or understanding competencies and providing that common language. Um, in one case, I know of a school that uses the, the critical traits that were uncovered through this process. Um, and they basically um, have run with them, post them on the wall, and they help to guide their interviewing, their recruiting, their development process, and everybody speaks of the seven critical traits. Um, and so then you hear people within the organization going, oh, they have, uh, they have low rebound time, meaning are they pretty resilient to stress? Oh, yes, they do. Uh, do they have high drive? Yes. Oh, do they have high perfectionism? Yes. Um, are they outspoken? Yes. So all of these things are really helpful um, uh, indicators to them as they go through and look at all these, the pieces of talent management in the school. Um, are there any questions here or any comments you have, Steve, before I move on to my next? No, I think uh, we're doing a great job. Um, and I think you've really helped everyone understand uh, the, the importance of competencies as it relates to kind of this uh, understanding the, the talent acquisition um, side. So we'll, we can transition to the next um, case to help uh, bring this into light. Uh, just a quick reminder, we just have a few minutes left mm -hmm. and then we'll wrap up. Um, with any uh, additional questions that we collect, we'll make sure we respond to everyone. And as a quick reminder, this is recorded. We'll also send everyone who joined us this morning and signed up a copy of today's presentation as well. So Monica, I'll take it, uh, I'll let you take it from here and help us transition to, to the next uh, case study. Great, thank you, Steve. Okay, so my next example, comes from working with a global organization. Um, it, I'm working with the global sales leaders who are helping the Salesforce um, team transition. Um, it's a huge change management effort where they're helping the Salesforce go from being essentially uh, a relationship style um, sales force, um, meaning I'm your point of contact within the organization. I'm here to make sure that you get the best seat in the house when you come to the uh, annual convention. I'm here to make sure you get your products on time. Um, and I'm going to invite you to dinner and go and play golf with you and get to know your family and what you want to do. Um, transitioning from that to being more of a sales consultant and then visiting with you and saying, oh, I see that your sales are down. Well, let's look at all these um, key performance indicators and see what's going on. Let's try to get, get into the the story sort of like the bottom line or the root cause of what's happening and how can i support you let me give you some insights or tools to help you um better market your products um or better motivate your um your sales your other sales um reps so it's a huge transition um and as part of that transition, we're wanting to uncover what makes a great consultative sales rep. Um, so this uh, global organization already has a competency model. They have, they created one precisely to reflect that consultative sales style approach. Um, they're using the competencies to specify the behaviors of what great consultative looks like in action. Um, they're using the competency model as the basis for a 180 survey, meaning this survey is not a 360 because it's only a survey that allows the manager to uh, give feedback to the sales rep 
and the sales rep to do a self report. But um, we are actually working on expanding the 180 to a 360. Um, but they're using that 180 survey based on the competency model to identify performance gaps. Um, they're using the competencies to create an assessment center or assessment center exercises for selecting new sales reps. Uh, in markets where they have found that with the transition, many of the many of the sales reps have chosen to leave the organization or are really thinking that this new way of selling is not for them. So there's a lot of urgency for hiring new sales reps and the competency model is being used to then create interview questions and give clarity to the regional sales um, managers to understand what to look for. What does this new type of sales uh, person look like? Um, they're also using competencies to develop formal training and sales development activities. Um, so actual courses, um, instructor-led courses that um, support the sales reps in developing certain competencies. For instance, one of the competencies that they are really struggling with in the transition is um, all of a sudden now they have to analyze business data. Um, and many of the sales reps are not um are not naturally inclined to work with numbers and analyze business data so a huge effort has been made to um to look at you know who are the people in our um in our team who are analyzing businesses really well what are the behaviors that they display what are the uh, the competencies that they bring to the table and how can we train others how can we teach others what these great um, sales reps are doing when they analyze a business and then finally they're coordinating with hr to cross-reference the corporate competencies with the functional ones so right now there's there's this tension where there's the the corporate wide competency model um, that sort of fits all functions, but now they have this very specific competency model for the consultative salesperson. And um, we're in the process of tying those two together to say, if you work on the competency of business acumen, which is a general or company wide competency, then by you know, by connection or by default, you'll also be working on how to um, conduct better, uh, provide better information in your consultative sales meeting. Um, so, um, so that's going to be very helpful in sort of reinforcing that competencies are tied to each other and that really it's just kind of one and the same. Um, and so then the competency model has helped to clarify performance and has helped guide development efforts. And again, it has provided a common language for talking about sales rep effectiveness and the nuances of consultative selling. Um, Monica, I wanna um, yeah. stop us there for the sake of time and, and really wanna say thank you and appreciate your expertise this morning. Um, we do have a quick question from the audience, so we have just enough time maybe to put that one out there. And uh, Monica, we'd like you to respond to this. So someone um, had asked specifically around teachers and selection, um, whether or not you find tools that are off the shelf and you're able to piecemeal kind of the, the scales and content to um, competencies and performance, or do you have more, uh, best is in your experience is it best to find a solution that tends to be customized to that uh, teacher selection situation sure and i appreciate the question i know that there's there's always budget to contend with um ideally if you have the budget um obviously a customized solution is really the best because as i've said in my experience as you go from one school to another no two schools are the same. 
the culture of one school may be very different from another school. So taking something off the shelf can be helpful in getting the conversation started. Um, but then perhaps if you're going to follow that approach, um, try to um, be very intentional in having a conversation about what does this look like in our environment. So, for instance, one of my schools is called Yes Prep. So, what does um, being resourceful, a resourceful teacher, look like at Yes Prep? Um, what does it look like? when you're an elementary teacher? What does it look like when you're in middle school? Um, so just taking that generic competency and putting it in context is going to be a critical part of the process. Thank you, Monica. I really appreciate it. I want to thank everyone who joined us this morning. Um, it, for everyone that was here, just remember, we're going to give you uh, the recording and the presentation. It'll be in your uh, inbox sometime later. Uh, in the week. And if you have any further questions or ideas or needs, please follow up with us and we'll make sure that Monica has uh, everyone's uh, email as well. And with that, Monica, if you can just transition to the very last side so, so that we can end. And again, I want to thank you for joining us, Monica, and sharing your expertise with everyone. Sure. Thank you. It's been my pleasure, Steve. Thank you so much for the opportunity and thanks for everyone who who joined us. Sure. And then toggle forward if you can so everyone can get your contact you. information. That would be terrific. Oh, yes. Here we go. There you go. Can everyone see it? I have a screen on, on front of mine, but I'm guessing that that's just me. Yeah, right? we're good, Monica. Thank you for doing that. Okay. And uh, thanks, everyone. I want everyone to have a good rest of your day and week and stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you.